Our next speaker is Dr. Bill Pearson. Dr. Pearson is a professional geologist with over 39 years of experience in the national and international mining industry in all phases from grassroots exploration through to advanced projects and mine development. He has carried out exploration programs in 15 countries in North and South America, Europe, East Asia, and Australia. From 2002 to its takeover in April 2006 by Yamana Gold Incorporated, Dr. Pearson was Vice President of Exploration for Desert Sun Mining Corporation. He directed exploration programs that increased the overall resource base significantly and discovered a major new extension to the Canavarius deposit. From October 2007 until its takeover by B2 Gold Incorporated in April 2009, Dr. Pearson was Executive Vice President of Exploration for Central Sun, directing exploration programs that discovered new zones at the Santa Pancha Mine and at Orosi, now Libertad, as well as significantly expanding mineral resources. Dr. Pearson was appointed President and CEO and Director of Coastal Gold, formerly Castilian Resources, on February 1, 2010, and has directed the company since then in exploration and development of the Hope Brook Gold Project in southwest Newfoundland. He is also Director of Transition Metals Corporation, a Canadian exploration generator company. Today, Bill will go through a project where the application of multidisciplinary industry academic investigations led to enhanced exploration targeting at Hope Brook in Newfoundland. Please welcome Bill Pearson. Well, thank you very much. A uh, real pleasure to be here. You don't know how joy, joyful it is to talk about interesting things about rocks and not show the latest depressing uh, stock chart. Uh, I will put in one commercial plug, though. Coastal Gold, trading symbol on TSXT is COD or COD, which is the perfect trading symbol if your flagship property happens to be in, in Newfoundland. Well, I'm going to talk today about enhanced exploration targeting. I think it fits in wonderfully to the, the most interesting presentations our, our previous speakers have made. And this is really a multidisciplinary, both industry and uh, academic uh, in investigations. Uh, the obligatory forward-looking statements, and in a talk like this, I can guarantee you there are some forward-looking statements. I firstly want to acknowledge and highlight my exploration team, a uh, terrific group led by Dave Copeland. Uh, he's got about 20 years' experience. And uh, he's been a terrific addition to our team over a year ago. Very strong DMS background, uh, extremely good in alteration. A lot of the alteration uh, data I, I'm presenting today was put together with them. Blake Highlands and Jeff Burke are two young geologists. And, you know, earlier on the speakers mentioned about building up your talent and training. Well, this whole process here has not only given us better exploration targets, as I'll show, but it's really elevated the level that our team operates at. No arousal, he's not a technical guy, but he manages all our project logistics and everything and makes sure my geologist can focus on finding more ore. Uh, two geophysics, our chief geophysicist, Chris Hale. Dr. Chris Hale actually taught in U of T here for 20 years. John Gilead, his partner. And they have worked uh, on the geophysical interpretations here, done a terrific job. And I'll show you how we've been integrating it with the geology. Uh, we've taken advantage of Quantex Titan 24 system, which did some very good work for us, as well as our own IP team. And our university research partners, uh, Western University, uh, Dr. Neil Banerjee, assistant prof there. And we've been working together for the last couple of years. Uh, Erica Kyer, a geology student there, working with Neil. And she's actually here today. You can wave your arm. There's a small little invasion of Western here at U of T, and Steve Piercy at Memorial, who is, uh, they've got some terrific uh, facilities there, as do they in Western, and uh, we've taken full advantage of that. So I'm going to run through and give you a very comprehensive presentation, really, here of our view of Hope Brook, and, and this is very much a work in progress. This is not ready to be written up into the definitive paper. And I want to show you how we've been building our picture, how we've been testing it, and how it's continuing to improve and optimize our exploration results, as well as show we think this property has far more potential than 
what we've even achieved to date. I'm going to talk about geophysics and how we've used that to outline mineralized zones. Obviously, this is a 3D thing, so I will talk about 3D inversion models, the nature and distribution of mineralization. We did quite a bit of interesting isotopic work, which is really, I think, very significant and tells us a lot about fluid source and origin. And lithogeochem and alteration, how this ties into geophysics and how to vector into higher grade areas. And then close off with what is our working model for the time being, which is a growing, evolving thing as a number of the previous speakers have indicated. So Hopebrook, we're down here in... Uh, southwestern Newfoundland here. Uh, it's, uh, we have quite a large property there. It's a historical producer, 752,000 ounces. In fact, actually it's the largest past producer as far as I'm aware in the Appalachians. And uh, that's the current mineral resource there which we're currently updating. So you can see between the past production, our current resource, this is a substantive gold deposit. And we're down here in the southwest part of the Avalon zone here in this fascinating part of the geological world called Newfoundland. So just to look at the Avalon zone here, it's a late Neoprotozoic assemblage of active plate margin sequences, and these were all accumulated prior to development and closure of the lower Proterozoic Iapetus uh, ocean. And if you want to see a remnants of Iapetus, go to Newfoundland, it's fascinating. There was also a very significant period of magnetic activity. This is very important for uh, the genesis of Hopebrook between 640 and 560 MA. And uh, there was a lot of volcanic and plutonic rocks during this period. And these evolved primarily in back arc or continental arc settings. And there's a broad association as well with terrestrial or marine siliciclastic sequences. That's certainly what we see at Hopebrook. Related in time, is the development of the gold mineralized systems in, in the Avalon and, and actually in the Avalon there are gold all the way up there although Hopebrook to date is the major uh, uh, example. There is intense post mineral deformation but we can recognize primary stratigraphy and alteration so I won't dwell on that except for a few major things that do affect our interpretation. There's been some good previous work on Hopebrook. Uh, Colin McKenzie's BP Salco exploration team found the deposit in 1983. And uh, he really uh, described the deposit well and placed the environment as a synvolcanic intrusive acid sulfate hydrothermal alteration system developed atop the Rodi intrusive suite. And Peter Stewart did a lot of work. As we'll show, I don't think the uh, Chetman granite has anything to do with anything. And then from the late uh, 90s, uh, Benoit Dubay and Sean O'Brien uh, did a lot of good structural work as well as regional work in the Avalon zone. So Hopebrook became known as a high sulfidation epithermal system. What we've done, and as I'll show you in this talk, is we've taken this and we've refined it. And we've also brought it into an exploration concept. It's fine to have a model. But if you can't use it to generate vectors to explore, it's not much use to you. So I'm going to show you that we think this is a high sulfidation system, definitely. But it's a mesothermal to epithermal. It's transitional, developed within this arc system. There's certainly nothing to do with the Chetwin granite. And there's a lot of commonalities with younger world-class high sulfidation systems uh, globally. And this map from uh, Dubay just gives you an idea of the, the dating here. Uh, the one here, Betty's Pond here, 563, that's the closest to us. And you can see this is where this alteration period is, somewhere between 570 and 580 uh, MA. Now this is a simplified geology map. Just to give you a general idea of the overall layout here, you can see this uh, major structure here. I've blown it up here. Uh, this is about eight kilometers long. This is the boundary between the Silurian up here, Lapoil, and the Avalon group, the late Proterozoic rocks. Uh, th this shear zone is probably 500 plus meters wide. This kind of looks like an intrusion, but as I'll show you, it's not. Uh, it's actually a sheet, and this zone uh, continues on. This is the Hopebrook. And these two down here were the original discoveries in the early 1900s. 
and there's another uh, showing here. There's actually mineralization all along this very, very extensive system. And this is the magnetic map here, total field magnetic. You can see the structure shows up as a prominent flow here. And you can see how this intrusion sort of falls apart here. It continues on here. As I say, it's a sheet. I know it's a sheet because I drilled the darn thing. This is a, a more detailed property geology map. I'm not going to dwell on it except to show you the major units here. Uh, you can see the red here, which is the uh, solidified zone here. There's actually two zones here. The Chet one seems to be a separate splay. We don't know exactly how they show. But anyway, you can see how it comes down here. This is the 240 zone. Uh, this is the updip projection here. And where, what I'm going to focus on is, is this area. The old mine is, is just up in here. And uh, you can see in the, in the, I can show you better in the section what the actual geology looks like in terms of the alteration and so forth. I always like showing this a picture to the investors because one of my bugs is you want to find a big mineral deposit, get in a big system. I've always liked this picture. I'm standing here uh, southwest of the, uh, the old open pit, which is just over the hill. You can see that little bug there. That's a helicopter. Uh, here you have the neoprotozoic rocks, the big shear zone here that's 500 meters wide. Most of this you're looking at up here is the argillic zone, which is a, a sericite porophyllite schist. Uh, Slicified zones are actually down here in the bottom here. The Sink Surf Fault here is the major boundary fault, and it's a myelinitic zone here that's probably 50 plus meters wide, and this is all uh, Silurian. And as I'll show you, this system is really very formed from a very long lived magmatic hydrothermal system. It's open along strike and down dip. Alteration pattern is similar to other larger scale epithermal systems. And there's lots of upside for higher grade mineralization. I'm going to go through and show you why I think that's the case. Uh, this is a long section here. Just to orientate yourself, uh, the zone strike is northeast, southwest, northeast being up here, southwest down here. This is the old mine area where, not surprisingly, most of our current resource is. Uh, this is the 240 zone, which was originally a blind drilling discovery. Uh, and this was the target zone we outlined uh, in the fall drilling program a year ago. You'll notice it doesn't come to surface, and I'll show you why. Uh, there's other targets here, and we've hypothesized somewhere down there there's a roadie intrusive, and I'll show you why we believe, uh, we believe that. And this, this is the area we actually drilled in, uh, just finished up recently, and that's the subject of our current uh, resource update. So looking at the general lithostratigraphy here, uh, in the structural foot wall we have what's called the pyrite zone. It's a fragmental unit, about 2 to 15 percent pyrite, about 30 to 80 meters thick. Uh, in this deposit, it's God's gift to the geophysicists because I'll show you how we've used this unit very effectively to trace the geology. Uh, this is our, our main unit where our, all our gold mineralization is. Uh, and it's a solidified zone, as I'll show you shortly. There's a couple of different phases. And it typically has anywhere from 2 to 4% pyrite, and in places up to 4% calco and bornite. Uh, you'll notice there's some altered, unaltered mafic dikes down here. These things are a pain in the neck uh, because they are in the, the, they are only found in the solidified mineralized zone. They are folded, so they're very difficult to model. And in fact, in our resource, we've done a dike dilution model, which could be a subject of another talk. Uh, the only good thing you can say about this, if you drill in here and you just hit this dike, you know if you move over five meters, you'll hit the mineralized zone. And then we have this advanced agilic zone, very, very thick, up to 300 meters, very, very extensive. And, and this has got uh, perophyllite, alunite, kaolinite. You see swelling phase when you see it in the core boxes after a week or so it swells up. And, uh, <clears throat> and we see the occasional preserved felsic fragments and, and quartz por porphyry. So that's the principal sequence here. Looking a little closer at the gold mineralization, it's within the, the uh, late Proterozoic Whittle Hill sandstone and third pond tuff succession. There are two major stages. This has been long recognized. There's a very early pervasive buff colored solicitation with lower grade mineralization, typically half to a gram per ton, about 50 to 80 meters thick. And a later, much more restrictive, 
but very important, gray buggy silicification, which is where your high-grade gold comes in. Uh, two grams, five gram plus, and we get significant copper. This is one of the examples from hole 23, which was a spectacular intersection. And this is pretty typical of what it looks like uh, in core. And here's a section. Here we have the pyritic zone in orange, the silicified mineralized zone here in red, and all this yellow is the argillic. You'll notice there's a slice of argillic here, and this is the big pink surf mile note zone. This, this section is just south of the old uh, pit. And then moving 900 meters further southwest, this is another section. And this is something that came out of our fall 2012 program. You remember I showed you that target zone when nothing was there? Well, we suspected there was big folds, and, and we proved it. This hole was actually uh, the first one ever drilled from north to south, and it's always good to not get locked into the same orientation. It's quite clear there's a fold structure, and as I'll show you, the geophysics confirms that. And, and so when we're up in the mine area, the sequence is steeply uh, dipping, but it's overturned, and here it seems to be a little bit... Uh, shallower. And that's just a 3D model just to give you an idea. This is the uh, constraining shell of our, our uh, potential open pit, the mine area, the 240. It's about 2.7 kilometers long here. So in terms of developing vectors for exploration, th th there's really five key questions we were really looking at that I'm focusing here on this talk is how do we trace these mineralized zones and outlined areas with strongest and most extensive solicitation. If we hit those, we usually get better results. And are these two stages of mineralization one stage that evolved from the same system, or are they two stages? Obviously, that's significant to know, because the later stage is where the best grade is, and grade is king these days. And how do we target these areas of better grade mineralization? And what's the size and scope at scale of the Hope Brook system, and how to to best integrate all this information into a new model. So what we did here was we did, as I mentioned originally, under uh, Dr. Chris Hale and John Gillia's direction, we did quite a lot of IP work. Uh, the Titan survey worked really well. Regrettably, we couldn't do MP because we have this giant ocean next to us, which unfortunately uh, negated that. But we got some very, very terrific results here. And, and this is a simple, uh, just a a long set, a cut of an inversion model here of the resistivity. You can see this blue unit here. Well, this is picking up the pyritic zone. It's obviously very low resistivity. You can see the mine here. This is our original constraining shell from our first resource. And the trend is pretty obvious. This, this stuff you could ignore. That's just a data effect. But uh, I was pretty impressed here. You can see it's pretty strong. Then it weakens a bit, and it's very strong. I thought, aha. Maybe this thing is all one big system. And this is in section here. And you will note the geophysicist in the office the audience. I got Chris to actually flip it around instead of the backward projection convention that geophysicists perpetually use. Uh, this, again, is resistivity. You can see the axis of the uh, football pyritic zone. That's the projection of our uh, block model here for the 240 zone and the axis of the... Uh, of the solidified zone. You also see the top here. It doesn't come to surface. And a lot of shallow drilling missed the whole thing. So that whole target there, which is about 1.2 kilometers, essentially undrilled. Now we'll get to the 3D stuff here. Uh, this is a, a, an inversion model in the UVC uh, 3D system here. Uh, this is conductivity. You can see, obviously, the pyritic zone is showing up. Uh, there's where the Hope Brook is. There's the position of the 240. Uh, there's no data over here because it's very difficult to sur survey over an open pit. But you can clearly see that uh, this zone runs along very, very nicely. Now, this is rather a, a, a neat uh, clip here that uh, Chris put together. This is in Geosoft, their 3D voxel model of DC conductivity. And this is one of the things I really, really like about 3D, it is to be able to take a block model and go through it and have a look at it and see what happens. Because I find when you just look at a 3D model, you actually miss a lot of stuff. I'm starting in the southwest here, and I'm slicing on sections. So we'll go through here. 
and you, and you can see the the pyritic zone here is showing up nicely and aha lo and behold well what do we have here it's clearly plunging now we're seeing it pretty strong here and uh and now you can see that well there's no doubt this thing is continuous so we're down around the 240 zone area there's the mine area up here there's no doubt those things are continuous and uh we'll just rotate around here and uh we'll come from the south north in the longitudinal and slice in and you can see this picking picking up and there we are it's a picture you can see see the uh the pyritic zone here picked up quite well and there's the resistive silicified mineralized zone which obviously don't show up as being very conductive so this has been a marvelous tool for us and we've applied this uh consistently and we also have confirmed this geophysical model in our 2010 drill program uh, you know we tested six targets over 3.4 kilometers uh, every single hole except two which caved on us hit the mineralized zone within a few meters of where we predicted and we had some pretty encouraging results so we're in the ballpark we're on first base how do we get further and this is where this collaborative research program comes in uh, and we looked at several things here uh, we looked at the isotopic work to ask that question well are we dealing with one or two stages and also how do we target higher grade uh, mineralization and uh, we've done a lot of analytical work uh, Erica was in there collecting a lot of samples and the results are, are pretty interesting here we also did some uh, mineralogy here this is uh, SEM and, and uh, mineral MLA mineral liberation analysis this is work done in um, in memorial phenomenal thing uh, you can see here for example there's Calco, there's a, a tin mineral called mawsonite, boronite here. Uh, it's hard to see, but you can see little gold grains here and here, also one up in here. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we got the sort of elements here, tin mercury particularly. It's very low arsenic, but it's there. Uh, and these tin mineral phases that are more epithermal in character. Now, the isotopes were really, really interesting. We took a selection from a variety of holes right across the deposit of all the all the wall rock, unmineralized, intrusive, uh, mafic dikes, et cetera. And then we took all the mineralized here, uh, half a gram up, including our spectacular intersection in hole 23, which is by far the highest grade ever returned in Oprah, 204 grams gold and almost 8% copper. And, and boy, we sure want to figure out where there's more of that. Uh, and you can see all of these... Uh, uh, the wall rock plot right on zero line and they have a range of about uh, uh, going from about four up to 12 here but as soon as you hit the mineralized stuff lo and behold it it plots right along practically a straight line with a a range of about one per mil so there's no doubt here that this is telling you that regardless of the mineralized lithology this is this is all formed out of the same uh, fluid source and uh, you know, these sort of wall rock ranges are very typical for volcanic sedimentary rocks. And uh, that was a big conclusion from that. Clearly, all these different styles, the two major styles we see is coming out of one fluid. And then uh, Dave Copeland did quite a bit of work <coughs> with the, uh, the data that Erica and Neil generated looking at the lithogeochemistry. I'm just going to run through this very quickly. Uh, these are some of the standard tectonic discrimination plots here. And you can see we're in calcalcum to transitional, we're in volcanic arc, I type, through in Yanacocha and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Lepado in the, in the Philippines as a comparison. And uh, so this is obviously what you would expect being in an island arc environment. If you look at the uh, uh, rare earth distribution here, well, this is quite interesting here. Uh, this is all uh, <coughs> primitive mantle normalized trace element plots. This is all data from our analytical work, uh, the analytical work at Western. So here we have the roti, very straightforward pattern. Here's Yanacocha. I mean, amazing, almost like a mirror image. And, and of course, if you look at this is light rare earths over here on the left side, heavy on the other side, and uh, 
the, the right side of the plot here is typically considered to be indicative of an area with high heat flow. Obviously, if you're in arc, high heat flow. And, and what really excites me about this when I saw it, clearly it has a large system written all over it. And looking at the pyrite and siliceous zone, well, are these two actually together? You can see with this plot, same REE plot, but you can see there's more alteration, but my goodness, they're the same pattern. So there's no doubt that these things are genetically related, and uh, this really cements the use of that pyritic zone as side of, sort of as a, a very key marker that we can interpret from our geophysics. And looking a little more at the alteration here, uh, there's lots of alteration between the main mine area here, 240. You can see the blue here, that's the strong zone of sodium depletion in the main silicified zone. It's pretty much a no-brainer. This continues over. This is, came out of our new drilling. We don't have any data in here, but it sure makes this thing look like a very, very interesting target. And, and this is a, an alteration index, a chlorate carbonate pyrite index, and you can see the same sort of pattern. And Dave has generated all sorts of uh, other diagrams that show the same sort of uh, pattern. So the key points that came out of this was lithogeochem and alteration support enhance the geophysical interpretation and it validates the use of the pyritic zone as a key marker for our geophysics. And the REE patterns, clay mineralogy, isotope data indicate a dynamic mesothermal to epithermal environment. And the patterns we're seeing are very comparable to world-class high sulfidation systems. So a key conclusion is potential size and scale of the Hopebrook mineralized system is much greater than previously recognized. And there's a simple model here, basically modified after Dubé with the Rodi intrusion down here, advanced argillic to the uh, more extensive buff silicic alteration and the much higher grade in here. There's very probably some earlier structural control here. Uh, that's influencing this whole thing. This is very preliminary, but it gives a pretty good picture. So our working hypothesis then, in terms of origin, uh, there's no doubt that the fluid responsible for the gold mineralization had a similar geochemical composition and uh, it will likely result of a single large system. And the overall low delta 18 O values suggest the possibility of hotter fluids. It might be expected that top uh, uh, of the uh, more than so than might be expected at the top of the system. I.e., we're looking at a transitional thing going from mesothermal to epithermal. We don't see any evidence we're at the top. And, and that is shown, we know there's an epithermal mineralogy signature here, but texturally and the isotopes indicate we're a bit deeper. So the implications here are, well, we're in this major magmatic mineralization a hydrothermal system. Hopebrook is not just the old deposit that was mined. It's a much, much more extensive, and you can see the obvious targets there. Um, we're coming mesothermal, emergent to more epithermal, but not shallow. And the age is likely related with the roti. So we have a hard look at roti intrusives. The pyritic zone uh, is an effective geophysical marker, and every geophysicist loves a deposit that has a good marker. And I think that the lithogeochem certainly appears to be the best vector to areas of potential higher grade mineralization. So just to conclude then, the, the geological, geophysical, geochemical, and isotope data have better characterized the overall mineralized system. And uh, I'm very enthusiastic about these collaborative research projects. And it's really enhanced knowledge of mineralogy alteration and likely fluid source. And it's also a, an important byproduct of it. It's a tremendous training opportunity for both the students in the university and the geologists, the young geologists, especially on our team. For instance, my young geologist Blake was down in Memorial. He did all that MLA analysis, so he learned a lot. Oakbrook's a far better, bigger system than previously believed, and we just scratched the surface. And, and we've now, I think, developed uh, vectors for much more efficient uh, uh, targeting. And obviously, we've been using the 3D. We integrate everything we have, uh, geophysics, geology, alteration. And uh, this is a constant norm in everything uh, we do. And just to conclude then, 
there's no question use of science and 3D technology has greatly enhanced exploration efficiency. And we continue to look forward to good results in the future. And if Mr. Goley can figure out how to get this market going and we can raise some more money, I think we can really show the world that this is a tremendous world-class system. Thank you. Well, what we showed there was, you know, sorry, uh, the question was if, if there had been any additional REE work done on the ROTI intrusive suite over the whole system. Uh, well, that, that data I showed, you know, comes out of some regional work, but uh, it's obviously, I think, something that uh, uh, university or researcher should definitely go, go after because, uh, you, you know, if you look at the whole Avalon zone, there are gold occurrences all up and down that zone. Now, if you go up to, like, the Beeren Peninsula, uh, <clears throat> for instance, Peter Dimmel's property, you'll see something at much more higher level. But my betting is that that suite's driving most of the gold mineralization. So understanding it, understanding it where it is. And, and I'd love to, if somebody could do a shallow, uh, shallow uh, seismic survey and tell me where that intrusion is, it's down there. Uh, and, and I think that's a very fruitful area for... Uh, further research. It's a little bit of out, out of scope of a, an exploration company, but it's uh, it's something Erica can talk to with Neil. Uh, yeah, there's a question about whether or not there's any boiling textures in the mineralization and whether there's any correlation with higher grade uh, zones. We, we don't really see, we certainly haven't seen any textures like that. The part of the problem is this is quite highly sheared. And uh, if they were there, you may have difficulty and, and, uh, and lost them. I do think, though, that we are deeper in the whole thing. And I think you're looking at not just a straight epithermal system. You're looking at one that's, that's also evolved structurally. Like, I certainly agree with Dubé that there was an original structural zone there. And that structure has been moving. You're, you're, you're right close to a, a, a major tectonic boundary here. And uh, that's probably influenced what's going on. So I think you're seeing a foundation. But to date, uh, I don't discount the possibility. It's something we keep an eye on. But to date, no, we haven't seen anything that would indicate a, a boiling point position. There's, there's essentially no carbonate in this system. Uh, really none. No. no. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. There really is uh, none. It's... It, it's also obviously a problem on the PEA side. We don't have any natural neutralizer there, but there's no carbonate at all that we've seen of any significance in the uh, in any of the alteration zones. Uh, we see a few veins and so forth. They tend to be uh, quartz thermally and they're late and, and they don't really have anything in But No, there isn't any carbonate. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a, a question about the, uh, about the uh, mafic dikes, which are included in the mineralized zone, uh, which are post-mineral but pre-last deformation. They are deformed. And, and the, uh, during BP's time there, they had a lot of problems with both estimating the volume and as well as difficulty with uh, processing. Well, really, there, there's two parts of that question. Number one, uh, they are difficult to model. And what we have done is we've taken all the level plans that we have, we digitized everything, we digitized the surface, and we figured out uh, basically a dike dilution model, and we've, we've back calculated against what we think is the percentage based on the different levels, uh, and we've been fine tuning that. Uh, the, the biggest problem is I think we can estimate a, a reasonable percentage, um, but it is a, an issue in space because they're, they're very difficult to model. However, in terms of potential production here, we're looking at a pit initially, and obviously it's much easier to deal. The other thing from the processing end, um, we're looking at, uh, in fact, we've done optical sorting, X-ray diffraction sorting, and uh, electromagnetic sorting, all of which work. So we're looking at the possibility of getting rid of this dike uh, material or a good chunk of it uh, prior to milling, and, and I think that's a very positive route and you're absolutely right, it did give problems in the mill. I think, too, though, the mill technology these days is far better than it was back in the 80s. 
And uh, I, so I think it's a very manageable problem.